Good evening. How are you doing? Hello there, Mr. Onfroy. How are you? Ah, man. I'm blessed. I'm giving thanks. Despite the circumstances, I'm giving thanks, man. Is it is it bad in Jamaica? The the um, storm? In, in 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 some places it's rough. Yeah, it's really rough because our roads are not the best in in all areas. So mm-hmm. a lot of people, it, there's a lot of flooding in um in a rural areas and um in a in a, a lot of a lot of parts of Kingston as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's literally underwater. People are waist deep. Cars are stuck. Yeah, yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah. And where are you located in, uh, in, in? I am in, I'm a little bit outside of Kingston, the area called um, Bull Bay. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's in like St. Andrew. So I'm like about 50 minutes outside of Kingston. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. How heard, are you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in Mexico, as, uh, as I mentioned. And we mm-hmm. have that same storm coming our way at 1 a.m. tonight. So yeah. Yeah. I figured um, anything hits us would, would be you and Florida and the rest of the Caribbean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, so that's where we're at. And, uh, and, and how long have you been in Jamaica for? When did you uh, get deported from, uh, from Florida? I got deported in... I arrived here October 27, 2016. 2016. Okay, so it's been mm-hmm. a bit. Yeah. Um, okay. I have a couple of questions here for you, but yeah, I don't. I don't really want it to be too much of an interview. Uh, but I would love to get your just your general thoughts on a, a couple topics and things like that. Hear a little bit more about kind of the situation. One of the things that I did want to talk to you about is, um, yeah, just like what was incarceration like? You know, like you you spent eight years behind bars for yeah eight and a half in total yeah. um immigration which i fought for a year so a total of eight and a half years seven and a half in um in the federal bureau of prisons and um another year in a, um, immigration mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. And, and that just seems crazy personally for me i just think that like all drugs should be legal you know mm-hmm. and uh, and now what you went in for with uh, marijuana and trafficking you yeah? <laughs> yeah yeah like i mean and, and, it's, and it's legal it's, it's legal now, right? <laughs> yeah now it's legal um you're familiar with mark emery mark emery no yeah they call him the prince of pot you're from canada right i'm from canada yeah yeah they call him the prince of pot i was locked up with him mm-hmm. um he was lobbying i think your government to to legalize marijuana a while back yeah. And um, the U.S. incarcerated him for, um, I think they call it interstate commerce for, um, I think he was, I, I, I don't want to speak of fully what I don't know, but I, I, I don't remember. Um, I think he was shipping marijuana seeds across state lines. And that's why the, the U.S. government um, incarcerated him. He did, um, they locked him up for, they, they gave him a nine year sentence. And I know, I think, Marijuana is now legal in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, I think 2018 it became fully legalized. That's crazy, right? So I did eight and a half out of a nine year sentence for something that's now fully legalized in a lot of states, mm-hmm. a lot of provinces in Canada, and damn near um, a lot of parts of the world. Yeah, it's it's wild. And one of the things as well, so I was in, I was in Philippines before the, the whole COVID thing happened. I was staying out mm-hmm. there and they, it was interesting because it's like looking at the laws for marijuana, it's like a life sentence. If you get caught with marijuana on you, you know, it's super yes. legal there. And it's yes, like, sir. Man, like, this is something that I can literally go to the store and buy in my country, yes, sir. but I can go to jail forever in this mm-hmm. country it's just like it's crazy to a lot of a lot of asian there's a couple of asian countries as well where where um is a death sentence mm-hmm. yeah for, for drugs yeah <laughs> it's like crazy it, right in indonesia i forget actually i guess they were bringing in uh heroin or something but like i think it's i forget what it is like the bali nine or something like that i forget the name of this group but they were smoking yeah. uh, heroin i believe from australia and then they all got yeah, yeah they, they got like firing squatted you know, they, like, they actually killed them. Yeah. They put them in front of a firing squad and shot, like shot them. And it's like, damn, that is crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. 
So I thought they would have given him at least a, 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 a lengthy sentence before they tried to execute him. They, they actually executed him. They, they didn't kill all of them. They killed a lot of them, I think like three or four of them, and then the rest of them got life prison sentences. Mm. And they're still there to this day. So yeah. Thank great. God for the West. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, it's unfortunate that they took like eight years from you, you know, just for yeah, for something something like that. But um and um I call that place my home, man. Yeah, I um I moved to America in nineteen ninety. So it was nineteen eighty eight. I had um my mom had given me a trip as um I guess you call it a because I had passed my, my um, they, they got a thing in Jamaica called a technical entrance, right? Mm-hmm. So I had passed for this technical high school. And as a, as a reward, she gave me a trip because I had gotten my visa at that time, 1988. And the first place I went to was um, Miami. Yeah. And we spent like a week in Miami. And I, then I came back home. Then 1989, we traveled again to Patterson, New Jersey. Then... Um, 1990 we moved to the u.s and i've been in the u.s until deportation so i moved to the u.s at 16 years old Mm -hmm. you know got my first job in the u.s got my first got my first 21 jobs in the u.s (laughs) i counted 21 jobs and i worked at least 21 jobs i worked at taco bell i worked at win dixie I worked at Publix. I worked for UPS. I worked for FedEx. Um, my first child arrived when I was 22. That's Ariana, 1996. My second child, 98. Um, my, 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 my third child was at 99, 2000. My last was in 2001. Mm-hmm. Right. It's Cause everything was two years before Corey. Corey was the last. It was 2001. Yeah. For, you know, my whole life was in America, man. And, um, you know, as uh, you know, the rest. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so the, w- what's the game plan for you right now? Like, are you, are, is your whole, are all your kids still in America? No, um, I have a, I have a newborn. I have a, a one-year-old. As okay. a, I can't say newborn, but I have a one-year-old daughter. Okay. Um, her name is Ayla. Yeah. So Ayla is born in, this is my fir- that's my first child in Jamaica. Mm-hmm. Everybody else is in the U.S. So like I said, it's Ariana, Jasse, Javon, and Corey. Mm-hmm. Those kids I had in the U.S. Now Ayla is my first child here in Jamaica. Um, what am I doing right now? Um, I'm working on my clothing line. Mm-hmm. I'm also working on um, the foundation, you know, putting the legalities together because it's, it's a process. Yeah, you know, these are all first for me. Never knew it was so tedious. Never knew that there was so much legalities involved. I knew there was some, but you know, it, it's turning out to be um, a lot more than I thought it was. Right, so yeah. I'm working on those two things right now. You know, and um, just um, taking things one at a time, man. Um, yeah, just working. Yeah. And I do, yeah, I hope there's some sort of way for you to get back into America. But. That's the crazy thing. Now, um, they just introduced a bill to the Senate. I know that, I know, let me see, in the House, they had passed it. It was passed to legalize marijuana on the federal level. Okay. But the, the Senate under, what's, what's his face? Um, Donald Trump mm-hmm. wasn't having it. Now that Joe Biden is in power, the Democrats, you know, they're a the majority in, this, in, in, the, in the Senate as well. Mm-hmm. They are, they have just introduced, I think, Booker and um, I think Booker and, and, and another guy who was a majority of the Senate for the Democrats. He just introduced a bill. I think it was almost a month ago. So I haven't heard anything new on that. Now, if that passes, marijuana be legal on the federal level. So then I don't know if my, my, if my charge would be expunged. I don't know if it would drop to a state level where it would be expunged on that. I don't know what the ramifications are. But mm. once that is passed, I know that's a good thing for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it would be um, interesting to, to kind of be like, okay, I, I got deported for something because I committed a crime, but that is no longer a crime. 
So like, does it right. just, like, would you have a criminal record? Because, you know, it's like, <sighs> man, that's, that's like, that's like putting a cart before the horse. Yeah. The first thing I want to know is I, I want, I want them to legalize it. And then, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I can walk up that hill afterwards because I know once it's legalized on the federal level, then it would be no longer a, a schedule one drug. Mm-hmm. So the charges for that, I don't know how they would do it. I don't know if it would be retroactive. I don't know if they would immediately expunge everyone who was incarcerated for marijuana, who was nonviolent. Cause mm-hmm. you know, stipulations with it. Cause you know, people who are charged with marijuana, but they're charged with violence as well. Yeah. My, my charges were nonviolent and it was conspiracy because they never actually caught me with anything. It was, I, I conspired to, mm-hmm. I was set up with an undercover informant, you know, who, who was wearing a wire, who was working with the feds. So when they caught me, they caught me on just the mere fact that I set the deal up, you know? So yeah. I was never incarcerated with, and I was never caught with anything. No guns, no drugs. It's just the fact that I set the deal up. Yeah. So my crime is nonviolent. Mm-hmm. And um, first time offender. So I think that should put me in a, in a, in a better stead than most. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, so I'm just, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, man. I'm hoping that um, that comes through. You know, if, even if it makes two more years, man, um, it doesn't matter. I'll just, there's a lot of unfinished business in America, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, when, this boy was, when this boy died, um, myself and his manager, along with his mother at the time, you know, when we were on good terms, mm-hmm. they had gotten a lawyer for me um, to see if I could, you know, come back for the, for the bereavement. Like, it's, it was like a bereavement visa. Mm-hmm. They, were, they were working on that, but the process would have taken at least three months. Mm-hmm. So, you know, obviously, you know, she, she kind of buried him quick. Yeah. She buried him 10 days after he died. Um, and long story, that, that, that basically, nothing, nothing came of that, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, that was a process that was about to be started, but never, never did happen. Um, so I never got to see him. I never got to, I never saw a funeral, man. Yeah. There was no, there was no live streaming of a funeral for me. There was no video of a funeral. That's it. I mean, nothing. I mean, once this kid died. I'm still coming to grips with it. Once yeah. this kid, once this kid died, in essence, everybody became a stranger. That was the that was the it's the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. You know, um, if they were to put this in a movie, it would be unbelievable. It would be like a movie, and still it happened to me, and it, and and at certain points, it's still unbelievable. I still haven't come to grips with it yet because, like I said, these are literally family members and mother of my son who I spoke to every single day before him dying. Never had an issue with, never had a problem with. Once he died, it's like I became, in essence, a stranger. You know what I mean? And the unfortunate thing, man, at the time, I could do nothing about it. Mm-hmm. My hands and my feet were tied. I couldn't, I couldn't yell and scream and say, yo, hey, let me see my son's funeral. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So no funeral. Never saw, you know, I saw like my daughter was at the viewing the day before the funeral, that thing at the BBNT center. Yeah. And she had, um, I quickly like took a picture of the body and that's the picture I still have. Mm -hmm. You know, that's all I saw of him. You know, I saw, you know, from his upper torso to his head laying in a coffin. Mm -hmm. That's it. You know? And, um, go ahead. 
I was just gonna ask more questions, but yeah, you you continue finish your finish your topic. Yeah, so you know, a lot of it, man, is a facade, man. A lot of it is a facade, you know, and and I don't, I don't care how a wicked a person is, right? Mm -hmm. If you are, if you are the wickedest father, if you're the, you know, you do a lot of dirt in the street. If you're the wickedest mother, you do a lot of dirt out there. You're still a father, right? And you're still a mother. Yeah. Now. I was never any of these things, you know, up until incarceration, mm -hmm. I was a good father to my children. But once you got incarcerated, a, a, a brand new picture is painted. And um, that's the narrative that, that that's being ran, you know, beyond the scenes and in public, that's the narrative. Mm -hmm. and is that you know, something is that something you think that um sort of what was your children's kind of minds been like hey he's in jail now like were they trying to poison it while you were while you were incarcerated or was it kind of like uh like you mentioned once uh once jose passed away the funniest the funniest thing is i messed up in a lot of ways man don't get it twisted i messed up in a lot of ways because um I cannot blame for anyone for my actions. My incarceration was all on me. I can't blame the system. I can't, you know, because, you know, prior to incarceration, I had a good life. You know what I mean? Made money and, and things were good. You know, you got to take the good with the bad, right? Yeah. So, you know, I was living by coastal. I was living between California, between the North Coast. I mean, between the West Coast and the East Coast you know, doing what I was doing, you know what I mean? Um, bought houses, you know, made sure that financially kids were good, but that life took you away from your children. You don't spend as much time with your children as you should. But whenever I do spend time, it's a lump sum of time. But when I'm gone, I'm gone, mm -hmm. right? Then, so Jasse was 10 when I got incarcerated. The last time I saw him was his 10th birthday party. January 23rd, Cleo had threw a birthday party for him at her home in Plantation, I think. I think it's Plantation she was living in. Mm -hmm. she, she, she threw a birthday party for him. And um, I had three of my four children there at the birthday party. You know, and um, two months later, I was incarcerated. And I was gone out of his life from he was 10 until 18 and a half mm -hmm. when I was free. When I came home, he was now incarcerated for a little while, you know? So during that time, you know, I heard little stories about, you know, her poisoning his mind or whatever, but I never believed it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, he was the only one that, that was told I was incarcerated from the jump. Ariana wasn't told right away. Corey wasn't told and Javon wasn't told. Cleo told him right away. Yeah, I mean, she she never waited a day nor. Oh, your father's in prison. That's it. So now you were ten years old, and you know that the figure that you feared is now gone. You know, for a young man, there's nothing to fear no more. There's nothing to to hold you in place. You know, so you know as a result, whatever happened happened. He lived, he lived freely. Yeah. Um. So that that says a lot, you know, how you feel about a person and, and how you feel about his father, right? So, again, incarceration, my fault. Um, as, as a result of incarceration, taken away from your children, you know? Yeah. Whatever happens, you have to accept it, good and bad. You know, so I'm thinking I'm gone for eight and a half years, but literally that's almost half of his life, man. Yeah, that's why. Because, it, sure because a year and a half after that, he would leave this earth forever. Mm -hmm. You know, 18 and a half to 20 and a half, he left this earth. Um, 18, see, 6, 18, 18. So that's 20 years and six months. Mm -hmm. 
So it was two years from me being free. He lived two more years. And I never got to physically see him nor hug him. The, the, the closest I came to physically seeing him was FaceTime. Yeah. You know, so we had, we had all our, our, our drama on the phone. We hashed out our issues on the phone. You know, we reasoned on the phone. We, whatever we did, we did on FaceTime. I never got to saw him, touch him, nothing. And, and you know, did you, did you try to? Was he kind of hesitant about that? Or, or, or was... um, when, when, once, he, once he started blowing up, once he, mm-hmm. he, got, he got famous, you know, um, a lot of people, I, I never revealed this, but I was going to come back to the U.S. illegally. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, we were working on it, but I just never, fe- I, I felt the time wasn't right because I had just gotten home. Yeah. You know, and I told him that, listen, I want to make sure I take care of certain things here first, you know, because I did eight and a half years mm-hmm. and coming back to, come back to America illegally, you know, any number could play. So I wanted to make sure that I was good in Jamaica first as far as, you know, putting certain things together. Um, I have a brother who is mentally ill. I wanted to make sure that he had a place to stay and, you know, mm-hmm. certain things need to get done. And it's just time wasn't on our side. Yeah. And I forgot, I actually forgot that you got deported and then he also had a criminal record too. So he couldn't. Yes, yeah, sir. Out. So he that- couldn't. And then once he got off, he was on probation. Mm-hmm. so he couldn't travel and I couldn't travel, you know? So the only liaison at one point would be, would have been Cleo. Yeah. You know, she came and saw me once her and my sister, Deandra and um, Chrissy, they came and saw me in Jamaica. And um, that's the one visit. Mm-hmm. That was a one-time visit, you know? And so I'm guessing that's sort of like, when you say you have business to do in America, it's kind of like get closure, get more closure by going yeah. to this mazzoli. Gotta get, yeah, got to get closure, man. Got to get closure. Yeah. I never, I still haven't, that's the best way to put it. I still haven't had, I still haven't gotten closure. Yeah. You know, um, you know, the rituals that, that we send our loved one off in is called a funeral. You know, mm-hmm. um, that, that never happened for me. You know, I saw a body, yeah, but I saw it on, on a screen. So your mind, you, you, you know it's real. You know it's real. You know it's real. But then there's a part of you that doesn't feel it's real. I don't know if I can explain this properly. No, you are, yeah. You, are. you know, um. So it, it feels like I st- whatever whatever this chapter is is unfinished, mm-hmm. you know. And now I know his body. I know his he's not in the mas- mausoleum. I know his body is encased in the mausoleum. I know his spirit is not there, sitting down waiting for me to come. But at the end of the day, for me as a father, you know, I need my closure. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever read Man's Search for Meaning? Repeat that. Have you ever read a book called Man's Search for Meaning? Man's Search for Meaning. I've come across it, but I've never gotten a chance to read it. No. You may, you may get some stuff out of that. It's, about, uh, Vic, it's by Viktor Frankl. He was uh, a Holocaust survivor. And yeah, mm-hmm. he, he was talking about like trying to find meaning in life. And there's like meaning through loving someone, through having a purpose mm-hmm. beyond yourself. And then he also found uh, like, like through struggle and suffering. But one of the things that was really interesting about it was he was talking to about his wife who was in a different concentration camp or in the girls section. And he was mm-hmm. like, thinking about her and just like the love that he had for her was giving him meaning to his life. And he's like, oh, like he realized uh, it, he explains it better than I can. But he, he realized that it didn't matter if she was alive or not. It was her spirit that he kind of loved. And that was kind of what helped keep him going. And things like that. And it, it, he realized like in this despair of like the worst place that human beings could go was that mm. like, it's like it doesn't the actual body isn't the important thing. You know, it is that spirit. And that's what kept him going. Yeah. 
so maybe maybe they'll maybe they'll like it i'm, I'm not sure I, I just throw i throw book recommendations out a lot so that's what i do matt man search for me victor frankel, frankel? yeah okay all right i'm gonna uh -huh. check that out one one question i wanted to ask you though Dwayne. what did you think about jose's face tattoos when you got them <laughs> What was, I was going totally, through your mind, man? Like, I was totally against it, man. Like I said, <laughs> bro, listen. Um, the only people I saw with face tattoo was was prisoners. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that that was one of the thing in there. You know, people would get tattooed friggin' damn near all over their body except their face because if you got face tattoos in prison, that means you know they'll lock you away even yeah. further in the prison solitary confinement because they're they're against tattoos they know people are doing it but um the culture i'm from at the time I'm from tattoos weren't a big thing in jamaica once i got to america and started living in america you know all that yeah people were tattooed up and everything but the face tattoo wave wasn't as big then 2016 came home and you know seeing my son with tattoos all over his face i'm like whoa and i had to remember that this is no longer your child this is this is your son yeah and he was actually a grown man then so yeah i had to i had to rock with it it was already done mm -hmm. yeah i guess you know no going back. i can't i can't say i can't even say till this day that it grows on me nah i'm from a whole i guess a different generation I'm almost 50 years old, man. Um, like I said, the most we'll see with women is, you know, a rose on their back and something, on, and the dudes might have something on their arms and sleeves or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this generation now, they got tattoos literally everywhere, man, on the bottom of their feet to the top of their head. Yeah. Women have tattoos right next to their anus. And so, yeah, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes around it, you know, the circle. Yeah, like I'm saying, it's, 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 the generation is, is, is a whole nother. <laughs> <laughs> so when I saw him, when I saw him with, that, with all them tattoos, man, I was like, okay, he's expressing himself. He's a rock star now. Yeah. You know, but hey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing to be, you know, like. Like even me, I'm like I'm I'm 30, right? So I'm I'm even a little mm -hmm. bit old, right? And mm -hmm. the so it's weird to see like how younger people, say 20 years old, grew up, and it's a completely different life than I had, you know. And it's just like, is isn't that crazy though, man? Isn't it yeah. crazy? Yeah, it's just a couple of years, you know. It's just like a, that's a that's a decade. A decade makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, it it tells you where you are as far as age wise. It, 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 not saying that you're old, but it makes you realize, God damn it, I'm no longer 20. I'm yeah. no longer my 20s. You know what I mean? Because the things that these, these kids are pushing the envelope into the stratosphere, man. They're pushing the envelope way past Earth. They're going hard and fast. You know, and then information is growing with these kids. So these kids now, it's almost like, they have to have an experience before they start listening to you because they're, they're gaining success so early, you know, because remember, I remember when, when I was in my teens, um, to become a millionaire, you had to, you know, you're going to have to put some work in, even as a drug dealer. Say you're a drug dealer, you're selling drugs. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be an overnight millionaire. These kids are literally becoming rock stars overnight. Um, so it's hard to tell them that you got to work for it or it's hard to give them a certain amount of advice. So they're making up their own rules as they go. You know, so his generation, the kids that grew up with him, the majority of them, you know, seeing these young kids making 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars at 20, at 18, you know what I mean? That's who they're influenced mm -hmm. by. You know? Yeah. So the things, the things that they're doing and going through now, we had, to, we had to have these experiences. A lot of us, we had these experiences in our late 20s and our 30s. I remember one time, um, he was supposed to send me some money. And um, he, 
because like I said, I, I just come home. I came home from when I was incarcerated. I came home from incarceration with 300 bucks in my pocket. Literally 300 bucks. So all that I had owned in America was gone. Yeah. You know, the land that I own, you know, got gobbled up through, through taxes. Um, the houses that I purchased, I had purchased them in other people's names. So I can't say none of those I own. You know, so, and then eight and a half years. So, come home, I got 300 bucks. At the time, I was with Corey's mom. She had sent me 250, and I had, you know, just messed around and worked in there, and, you know, and um, got 50 bucks. I came home with 300 bucks. Yeah. And thank God, my mother had a, the home that we grew up in. She still had that home. So, I was there. And then once he, once he blew his first contract, he had called him. He's like, yo, dad, I want to buy you a house. I like, and so you and grandma can live in it in Jamaica. And I had to break it down to him. Like, yo, you can't have grandma come back to Jamaica, man. Jamaica is rough for grandma. So anyways, you know, he was excited. And, um, he kept pressing me, pressing me about, about, um, did you find a house? It's almost like he expected me to find a house in a week. So <laughs> he had he had called me, said he's gonna send some money for me, you know, just some pocket money, whatever. Okay. And um, he never came through. So the following day, I'd call him like, "Hey, what's up with you?" He's like, "Oh man, my bad, Dad. I had this dumb five some last night, and I'm tired." I said, "You had a what?" He said, "Yeah, I had a five some." I said, "What's a five some? I know about a three some." He said, that's me and four broads. Now, this kid is barely 20. He's in bed with four other, him and four women. Mm -hmm. What the hell are you going to do with four women, man? It's, yeah, three, uh, having a threesome is stressful enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, sexually, that's the life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and the average kid now in high school has had a threesome. You and me, well, I know for me, for my generation, but we have a threesome. It's like this. It's, it's this big thing. It's, it's this grown-up thing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the places that they're going, the things that they're doing, the drugs that they're doing, you know, me and you, I guess for me, it's marijuana. And, you know, you got people that take coke and heroin. Those were the three drugs. Now these kids are doing meth. They're doing Molly. They're doing Xanax. They're doing this. They're, they're pushing the envelope, man. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're doing things that I could never think of. You know, for, so for this generation, man, they're growing up fast, man. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and I think a, one of the major contributors to that is social media. And it's like... <laughs> Yes, it's like it's a contributor to it. And then it's also like the downfall of it as well. Right. Like, so like we didn't evolve to have everything change so quickly, you know, like at least right. from like 1900 to 1990, the world was pretty stable, you know, like there was some changes yes. here and there, but then now over the last like 30 years, it's been, yeah, the internet just turned 30 the other day. Um, it has grown. It has grown exponentially. It, it changes that mean every year. Like every yeah, new world. You know, it's it's almost like having a ball that grows in every single direction. Mm -hmm. It expands in every like a balloon, every single direction. And it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not yearly. It's like every six months. It's it's like every six months, bro. Like I remember the first cell phone. I remember the first cell phone, man. At the first time I had to burn a cell phone. Mm -hmm. That was a big thing then back in Florida. You know, had you, had you a burn a cell phone, had you a flip, had you a razor, whatever. The, you know, you know, Motorola made a phone called a razor. You heard about that, right? I, I remember the razor. Yeah, don't worry. I'm, I'm an old man. Okay, so now, now, now every three months there's a new friggin' iPhone. Yes. Every three months there's a new Samsung. There's a new this and there's a new that. You know, there's a new something brand new and these these freaking little babies know how to use these things mm -hmm. i remember it was 2000 i think it was 2006 when facebook came out yeah right there 
Facebook had just launched, started, they, they weren't public yet. And the first iPhone came out. I thought I was tech savvy. Then I went away and I came back eight and a half years later. And I feel like a literal, um, like a Neanderthal, man. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like a dinosaur. I have no clue what the hell I'm doing on this internet. And I thought I was savvy. I thought I knew what the hell I was doing. Things have moved so fast. You know? Um, so, yeah. At, at least you were around for the first iPhone, so it wasn't too new for you. Like, imagine you went away during, like, the Motorola Razor era, and you come back, and there's these iPhone 12s or 4s. No, 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 no. I got, I got brethren. I got people I know who have been incarcerated as well mm-hmm. and been deported. And they, they've been away before the first cell phone was, came out. They yeah. literally don't know how the hell to use a cell phone. They didn't know how to use a cell phone. But as you said, you touched on the topic. We aren't evolved enough to deal with the technology, how it's evolving. Mm-hmm. We, as, we as people haven't evolved. So technology is moving faster than us. So it has become our, our, our children's teacher. You know what I mean? So you can reason with your son who is 15 and you try to tell him X, Y, Z and he's going to Google it and say, nah, you're wrong. Yeah. This, this didn't happen then. Based on what Google said, this is not how it happened. Mm-hmm. You're competing against that, man. Yeah. And um, that's what he grew up with. That's what Jase grew up with as well, because this 10-year-old kid who, had, you know, was just playing with toys, when I came home, he, he, he was this tech-savvy kid, man. Yeah, exactly. No, he, he, was using, he was using all this social media real good. Like he listen, man. Blowing listen. Up or even, like, became a rapper, listen. right? Um, I went away, and I left Jase Dwayne Ricardo on Floyd. And when I came back, I was learning about XXX Tentacion. I was getting to know this person because I came home and it's like I was stuck in a bubble because I left babies. I left yay high kids, you know? Yeah. And I came home to men and women. The only person I kind of watch step up and grow was Corey because Corey's mom made sure that you know, in, in the latter part of my incarceration, she brought Corey around. She brought Corey when he was 11 to see me. Because when I, when, I, when I left, Corey was six. Mm-hmm. And then five years into my incarceration, you know, we, we, had, we had formed a, a relationship. And she brought Corey to me um, at 11. So I kind of watched Corey's height change in prison. Mm-hmm. You would watch the pictures first. I remember the first picture, he was looking up at me, smiling. And then you kind of saw a progression to the pictures. I think is, you know, like the third month or the sixth month or whatever, he was on the same height as me. Now Corey is like, what, 6'2", 6'3"? I'm 5'9", bro. I'm 5 feet 9 inches. That's the only person I kind of saw, you know, his progression, Mm -hmm. you know, Ariana came to me when incarcerated. She was what, 17 or 18? Jase never, you know, he could never come to visit because he had started catching all these little juvenile charges and then, you know, adult charges. So he couldn't come to visit, you know? Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so when, when I got home, I'm still looking at them like kids. I'm still looking at them like I can teach them you know, baby stuff or, or teenage stuff. They were adults by then, right? Yeah. I had to catch up. I had to mentally catch up that you're not speaking to, to, to babies anymore. You're speaking to young people, young adults. You got you to gotta reapproach them, you know? And, mm-hmm. you know, in, in a lot of ways, I'm still, I'm still coming to grips with that, you know? The hardest... The thing you can never get back is time. Absolutely. You know, when, once, 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 once you lose that time, you can't rewind it. This is not total recall. You know, you can't, you know, the only way you get to 
see is if it's recorded in videos and snippets and snippets of their lives. Because mm-hmm. I missed I missed the whole eight and a half years of his life. Like I said, I left Jasse and I came back to Triple X Tentacion. Um, an upcoming rock star, a rock star, an influencer, a, a generation influencer. I didn't know who this person was. Mm-hmm. I had to really understand. I didn't know. Who's, and still to this day, um, I'm learning about who this person was through these kids on my DMs and, and all the other platforms that speaks of them. I missed that, that whole window. Mm-hmm. You know, um, when I spoke to this person, I still seen him as Jase. I didn't look at him and call him what everybody else called him. X or that was weird to me. Yeah. I'm not gonna call you no fucking X. You know what I mean? I'm your father. I don't care <laughs> what you say. I'm not calling and, and I he and, and and um with all due respect, he never tried to have me call him X. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, it was it was up to a certain point. Um, it was still that. And then pops. And then when he got when he when he wanted to be disrespectful, he tried to call me Andrew. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But um, other than that, man, it was never no, yeah. And, and it's interesting. One of the things, uh, like you touched on, that you he grew up without you being there. But I can also see like some of the stuff that you're posting on Instagram. It is resembling a lot of the stuff that he talked about as well, right? So so like you said, a lot of different. Uh, kids are in your DM saying how much he changed their life. And one of the things about that was he was always talking about like the law of attraction and, uh, and the, the universal laws and study those and, and learn about those and operate through those. Uh, and then, yeah, the other day you were talking about learning the spiritual and the biblical laws as well. So it's, it's interesting that it's like, even though you guys weren't in each other's lives for like that main part where he was growing up, like when he was becoming a man, you guys do have a lot of different overlap there. So I'll say this. To hate your father is to hate yourself. Your father could be the worst bum piece of shit. You understand? Mm-hmm. But to hate your father is to hate yourself. Because you could run to the east, run to the north, run to the south, run to the west. You are going to become your father. Make sure you become the better version of him. But, and the same thing is to hate your mother is to hate yourself and to hate your life. Because these people are responsible for you coming to this place that we call earth. These people are the conduits through by which you came to this place. You know what I mean? So if for nothing else, if for nothing else, you got to respect the title that they hold. If you respect nothing else, nothing else. I don't respect you as a man. I don't respect you as a human being, but I respect you, uh, the title that you hold. You hold the title of father. Mm-hmm. And I'll give that respect. You know what I mean? But who Jasse is, is a piece of his mother and his father. Who every person on this earth is, is a piece of your mother and your father. Every single, every single being that's ever touched this earth. And that's what makes the God that we serve great. You can never replicate, duplicate. You can never replace. You can never change anything that the creator creates. I mean, literally, not even a morsel. Because a man could never turn into a woman or a woman turn into a man. Because once you turn into a woman, you can never bring forth babies. You can't put a womb in a, and vice versa. You can't change nothing that God put together. You can cut your toes off, cut your head off, or whatever the case may be, you'll be dead. But like, but you get the point I'm, I'm, I'm saying. We cannot, we cannot duplicate God's creation. So you trying to say, oh man, I'm not like my father, or man, nothing like my mother. That's not even true. That's not even true. You know what I mean? So what you see of him, I can't take credit and say, oh yeah, he's like me or whatever. It's just what it is. You know, um, it's just when I, 
there I go. would call, I would try to reach him every week. You know what I mean? And then once, you know, he started his life, like I said, you know what was happening. You know, I would call and sometimes I wouldn't get him for like a whole month. You know, whenever we do get, I would see him trying to keep that respect, you know, let me know what's going on in his life. And, you know, I think 14 was the rough part when things started changing. I remember I called and he was, um, he had ran away from Cleo. And um, Ariana had sent her mom to go get him. And he was staying at Ariana's, which is his older sister. Yeah. And I had called the house and he was there. And he got disrespectful, you know, he tried to get slick out the mouth or whatever. And I either tell him to get off the phone or whatever. I don't want to talk to him no more, or whatever. I want to speak to Ariana. He tried to have Ariana hang the phone up. And as a result of that, they had a rift because of me, you know, because of his disrespect. And he held that grudge against Ariana and me until, you know, it kind of came out when he was older. But after that, you know, we would we would talk, you know, maybe a month would go by whenever I catch him because it was still, still that same 954 number he had for years upon years. And I'm thankful that he never changed it. So I would either, I would either speak to him at his grandmother's house because he was staying with Cleo's mom mm -hmm. for a while. Um, or I would get him on the cell phone. You know, we would reason. We'd reason about a lot of different things, man. You know, I would try to recommend certain books for him to read. You know, because um, at the time we had gotten a hold, you know, what was big in prison was um, Robert Greene's um, 48 Laws of Power. It's a great one. Laws of, you know, um, the, the, the Laws of Attraction, the, um, the Art of Seduction, um, yeah. the Art of War. And I would recommend these books to him to, for him to read, man, because like I said, you know, in there it's a lot of downtime. And if you're not working out, going to school or, you know, doing something productive, you know, you, there's a lot of things to get into that's negative. So I try to take, you know, I try to elevate and expound my mental, you know. So whatever I read, I would recommend them to him, you know. And um, like his life experiences happen as well, you know. And what you saw is what you saw, you know. Mm -hmm. I can't take I can't take credit for all of it, but like I said, it is what it is. You know, when I when I I was proud of the young man. You know what I mean? Because for for a young man who never liked school, <laughs> the kid was beyond his years, man. He was smart. He was smart for a, for being twenty years old. He was incredibly intelligent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And very instinctive. Yeah, very instinctive is one of the things uh, that I would say about him too. Like he was able to, you know, like mental health being a huge issue with the younger generation. That was one of the things that he like, he recognized that he recognized that in himself. And he recognized that as like a community of like young people, that's something that he could help with, you know? And then mm -hmm. that's kind of what he put like, like his last two albums were all about that, you know, like, like 17 and question mark. They were like, a lot of it was just about like being alone, feeling the pain of that, you know, and feeling like rejected and heartbreak, things like that. And people mm -hmm. really resonated with it. And I, like, I think that intuition that he had on people's feelings, it was something special. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she is, he is my kid, but I can, even if he wasn't, the music that he made, oh my God. Um, one of my favorite tracks was, um, that, 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 that just blew my mind was um, the one where he's like, um, I've dug two graves for us, my dear. Yeah, I yeah. think it's called Gar Garrett's Revenge. Garrett's Revenge. Oh, right. man. That was, that is, that is my first, because like it's the first time I've actually heard him singing. Because mm -hmm. I remember when, um, because I think it was like, oh, this is like 2015. Yeah. So 2015, um, me and him had gotten back to a good place because um, 
my mom had had experienced double aneurysm, right? And um, she had double aneurysm, bro. She had two blood clots on the left and the right side of the brain. Mm. And I didn't know, you know, at, at one point it was touch and go. And I think the December after they, after they, maybe I'm missing the timeline. Maybe it was before or whatever. But anyways, I spoke to him on the phone and I'm like, you know, what are you doing, man? You know, um, you know, your mom, grandma is having like a little get together at the house. I want you to represent me around that, you know? It's like, yeah, yeah cool, dad. I, I, I'll go there, go on your behalf. I was like, okay, that's what's up. Anyways, we were talking on the phone. I'm like, so what you do? What, what's, what's going on with you? He's like, yo, um, he said, I'm a rapper. I said, you're a rapper? He's like, yeah. I said, you know, so what's, what's, what's your style? He's like, he's like, dad. And I heard the conviction in his voice. He's like, yo, it's nothing that you'll ever can put your finger on. So I said, what you mean? He's like, you can't even call what I do rap. He said like, yo, my stuff is so different right now that if Jay-Z heard me, Jay-Z would sign me that. I remember him saying that, but it was the, it was that, it was that self-assuredness, that, that knowing. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I felt it. I felt it through the phone. And then when I heard him rap, I went crazy. I think, I, I can't remember which rap it was for me. Uh, I think it was, I think it was close to that, that, that style with him and, him and, um, Slump got at with a yeah 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 so so but he had did something for me on the phone that I nearly lost my goddamn mind so I was like hold on so one of my partners who I used to work out with his name is M1 short I mean fucker is solid mm -hmm. so anyways I, I put M1 on the phone and I was like yo listen to this person man tell me what you think. And he rapped for him. And I, and I was watching, I was watching M1's face on the phone. And you know when somebody's eye pop? Yeah. You know when something hits somebody and you see their eye pop? Because you know when somebody's faking it. You mm -hmm. watch their body language. Like, yeah. You know when somebody's trying to force to say, well, yeah, this is good just because you and them friends. But you see the reaction on their face that cannot be denied. And he's like, yo, who is that? I said, what do you think? What are you He's like, yo. I said, that's my son. He's like, that's your son? So anyways, he called another partner of mine on the cell block. I said, yo, let him like, rap for him. I was like, all right, boom, put him on the phone. And um, I think I realized I just saw it. And some kids would send that to me like afterwards. Like, yo, your son talked about you a lot, man. Then it, he sent, I think he was on Twitter at the time. He's like, yo, I rap for my dad on, on the cell block. And him and his friends went crazy. When I'm, I'm telling you, man, like, I told the kid, because I remember the reasoning was, I said, y'all say, man, this ain't about if you're going to be successful. You're going to be successful. It's about what you do after you're successful. Because the world will be watching. It's, it's, it's like I, I knew, I knew, but I, I never expected this level. Yeah. You know what I mean? I never... You know, I knew he was going to make waves, but I never expected to say, well, I expected a number one or number ones or whatever is doing. I never expected, but, but for success for me was touring and making a living from what he's doing. Yeah. This other stuff is another level. You know what I mean? I knew the kid was always special. You know what I mean? I knew he was always a special kid, but on this level, yeah, I can't say, yo, I expected this level. I expected success, but not to the stratosphere, not to where you're influencing a whole nother generation. Like I said, I'm, 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 I'm so far away from everything. Mm -hmm. I'm all the way in Jamaica, so I'm not feeling how it reverberates, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm feeling the aftershock. Like the, the you know the, the earthquake is felt in America, then you feel a ripple effect here in Jamaica. 
Mm-hmm. That's really what I'm feeling. So I'm not on the ground to say, well, you know, the pandemonium that he had caused. I see the videos and I see all the things and I hear like afterwards, you know what I mean? But I knew, I knew the kid was going to do big things, man. But, you know, this was another level, you know? It was almost like he didn't have, you know, the ceilings that we have that hold us back all the time. You know, they're like mental, mental. I swear to God, man. You know, he didn't yeah. have, and it's, it's inspiring to see, you know, it's like, I get a lot of inspiration from him. It's just like, damn, like he, you know, like you said, he had that self-assuredness. It's like he knew where he was going. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's just, unfortunately, you know, the light burns so bright and so fast. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because um, he could have done much more. You know, and um, it's a good segue. So, Marie, the foundation, the Unfur Foundation, you know, the, the, the things that he championed, like, like he was championing um, mental health. You know, that was a big thing to him. Yeah. I can't tell you that I, I fully comprehend mental health but I comprehend it somewhat because um, I have a brother who is now a, a, a diagnosed with schizophrenic, schizophrenic, is it schizophrenic, is it schizophrenic bipolar, something like that. Yeah. yeah. But he's, he, you know, mental health has been, it, it, is a, it has affected my family way before Jasse was even two years old, way before he was born. You know, my mom has, so mental, mental illness has ran in my family. My mom had a cousin named Peter who was mentally ill. And now, like I said, my brother that, you know, I would call him a father figure, you know, is diagnosed schizophrenic. Um, but like I said, my culture, we're, 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 not a, we're not a sensitive culture. We're not sensitive to a lot of things. You know, where mental health is concerned, we don't. We don't give it the attention that it needs. People who with mental health issues are, are, are ostracized, are discarded. You know? So I knew he won the cha- um, champion, you know, that. So I would love to, I would love to continue that journey. I would love to continue that, you know, which he started. Um, And while I'm doing that, I would love to come to the full understanding or as much as I possibly can. Because I can't say, yo, I understand it. If you've never walked in a man's shoes, you can't, you can't fathom what he's going through. When a kid gets on the phone and say, I feel suicidal today. Don't say he's trying to, um, what's that word? He's just seeking attention. Yeah, exactly. You got to take that ish seriously. You know, you got to take it seriously. And um, along with a couple other things that he's been, you know, he started, I want to continue those things. But at the top of the list, I know he was big on mental health. Yeah, and that's, that's what drove a lot of people to him is, you know, like, like he was, I've talked to a lot of his fans before and they're all saying that, yeah, it's like he made me feel, you know, heard a little bit. You know, I didn't know that uh, I didn't know that someone could like there's other people like me, like I feel alone. And it's something actually like I work in the in the field of mental health. I help with uh, anxiety and and uh, and, and kind of like mild mental illness. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yeah, that was that's something that I realized when I first started getting into this. Like it's something like I never understood it until I went through it. And I was like, oh, damn, this is. Now, this is brutal. This is like the most difficult thing I've ever gone through in my life, you know, and I was a grown man when I went through it. And then I started understanding it a little bit more. And then I started working in this field and helping people with it. And that's one of the things I hear a lot is just like, they're just like, they just don't feel they have anyone to talk to about it. And like you said, like your culture isn't very sensitive to it. And a lot of cultures aren't very sensitive to it. And it's something that's like, like getting that out in the open, helping people know about that. It's something it's going to be important. And like with our social media, with everything moving so quickly, no one feels stable, you know, no one feels like they have any control, any grasp on, on life at all. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's scary. 
um, just embarking on this charity. Um, the realization, if you're not mentally strong, you will run and hide under a rock. Um, this kid is very polarizing, man. This this kid had this kid had left some big friggin' shoes to fill, and I'm a grown ass man. This this kid, I'm serious. This kid has left some huge shoes to fill, and. I remember when he died, you know, a lot of people would have said, you know, put this out, put that out, do this and do that. And I swear to you, kid, I have never tried to make a dollar for this kid. I have never made a dollar from him. I've never received a dollar from the estate. When I said not one dollar, I have not received a dollar from the estate. Um, I have never tried to do anything to tarnish his image. I sat three years in limbo trying to figure out what the hell am I gonna do? You know, and um, how am I gonna, is this real? Is this kid gonna, is he playing a joke? Is this a prank? Is it, is it real? Are these people really that cold, you know? Is the fa okay? The family's gonna come around. I'm, I gotta give them some time. Um, yeah, they, they they love me. They'll understand that as a father, I'm hurting. I went through all this. I went through all the emotions. I went through all the anger and everything. And um, I finally realized that I have to be present. I have to wake up. I have to, you know, with the help of God, I got to heal myself. Because none of them going to walk through that door and say, yo, we're sorry. We understand what you're going through as a father. Even though you are an asshole, even though we feel like you're an asshole and a bully, we still love you. None of that ever came. Um... And every single day in my DMs, there's kids saying, I miss him. I feel like killing myself. I miss him. What am I going to do? I need help. That's a lot, man. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big responsibility that you were just handed, you know? Um, and as a result of understanding, comprehending the responsibility, I had to take my time, but I, I realized I can't take too much time because every day matters. The time that you lose, you cannot get back. You can't rush, but you can't move like a snail at the same time. So I'm not, I'm not big on begging where charity is concerned. I've never done that before. And they say pride go before a fall or whatever. So my plans are with this clothing line, this clothing line is directly going to affect this charity. The clothing line will be the funding for this charity. And my charity, my personal charity is education. Yeah. My personal charity is education. I wanna be responsible for kids going to college I want to be responsible for the less fortunate kid who is, is friggin' smart but doesn't have the opportunity to be able to go, you know, beyond where he would have stopped at. You know, the, the single mother, the father might be out of the family for whatever reason, whether it be incarceration, whether it be death or just left. You know what I mean? And like I said, I want to champion his charity as well, which is mental illness. And I know that's a little bit more beyond me. 
So as far as those who are professionals, I want to ha- I want to get them involved where this is concerned. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that's that's my next move, man. And are those uh, are those up and running right now? The I saw the the the, the, the clothing company is up. Okay. Up and running right now. It's up right now. Um, it's you know, all the legalities about it is still in, still ongoing. But the major part, as far as the 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 the, the, the clothing company itself, it's whatever I need to do is is being done. And um, I give myself about another month before I kind of push everything out. Okay. Start pushing stuff out piece by piece. And as I said, every sale from every piece of merchandise I sell would directly go towards the charity. And you, you ship to Mexico or what? Um, <laughs> that's the next part of working on that. Like I said, this is new to me. <laughs> so I, I know that, I know that a lot of my, a lot of my, um, what we call them uh, manufacturers, they yeah. do drop shipping. So mm-hmm. I'm assuming that Mexico would be a part of the whole thing as far as shipping to Mexico. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let me order. This, some, uh, I'll order some stuff, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll post some links in the description here for for. It. Yes, 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 sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Um, like I said, it's it's a lot, man. The platform I've been given, I'm thankful. Yeah. You know, I don't take it for granted. I am not going to squander. I'm not going to waste it. I'm thankful. Um. Also. Um, I know September is should be the first official hearing and then hopefully the trial will begin because it's been almost three and a half years mm-hmm. you know i i want to see justice served i was two years late in asking for the death penalty because the truth of the matter is i believe that the young man who pulled the trigger knew what he was doing, was fully aware of what he was doing. And um, he should accept responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, the... Uh, you, for me... You read Look at for, Me, the, the book, the biography. Yeah. 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 It, it talks yeah. about the, the, the day that, uh, that he, was, he was killed, and it's like, yeah, like it was completely unnecessary. Like, he... So Come dude, on, man. You you telling me that you telling me that because this kid wouldn't give up his stuff, yeah. You turn around and just you you already got his stuff. You already punked him. You know what I mean? Yeah. You yeah. already punked him. He took fifty grand from him. He took his stuff. You turn around and squeeze, man. You trying to take my kid's head off? He was trying to he was trying to give the kid all all the headshots, man. Yeah. He was trying to disrespect him, man. Even in death. He wasn't just going to regular kill him. He tried to take his head off. It's the grace of God why he still had the face left. This kid was trying to take his whole head off, man. May God forgive me, man, but a life for a life, man. Yeah, in that case, most certainly. I know I hear everybody screaming how, you know, how influential Jasse is and this and that, man, but I don't care what it is, man. The truth of the matter, I'd rather him be a nobody and still be alive, man. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 you know, you can't, you can't change after the fact. After the fact is what after the fact. I can't turn back time. He's already gone. And I know he has, you know, influence a lot of kids in a positive way and, and, and all these things. But from a parent perspective, it wasn't your life to take. It wasn't, I, I don't care what's being said about him, what he was involved in, this and that. That's, you're not God. I don't care whoever passed the judgment or whatever. That kid has never taken anyone's life. Mm-hmm. He has done some you know, he has done some BS. You know what I mean? But he has never taken a life. You know, whatever he did as a teenager, he did. 
and he started making the the about face. You know, he really started changing his life all the way around. He started realizing the responsibility that which he had. He started realizing the response, the, 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 the influence which he had over a generation. And he started taking that seriously. Just when he's about to turn that corner fully, you know? But um, I pray that this prosecutor is not a waste of the government's resources. I hope he's worth his salt. Mm -hmm. And if it's even life in prison, I'll take that. Wow. I know I know that that penalty is off the board. Yeah. Well, it's pretty well, you know, it's pretty set that that's what he's getting and all his buddies are getting. So that's good at least. Um, the craziest thing is the other two ride-alongs, if they get life, they get life. If they don't, they don't. Mm -hmm. The two who stepped out of the car, the two who stepped out of the car with the guns, nothing less than life, man. Yeah. Nothing less than life. No 20 years, no 30 years, no 40 years, none of that. Life. If, you, if, if they can't get a death penalty, life without the possibility of parole. I don't care what the public see my son as. You took away my child, man. You took away one of my children off from the face of the earth and they will never come back. So, September is when the, um, hopefully they haven't pushed it back again because it was supposed to be in, since June. I know this COVID had changed a lot of things for the past year and a half, going on two years. Yeah. But, um, you know, the date is set for September. God's willing. Everything will go off where it's supposed to go. They'll either plea out. They'll either go to trial. I know there was two, two of the young men who have turned states, evidence, whatever. Yeah. You know, they're, they're talking against the other two. So I'm almost certain that those two will not get life. Yeah. You know, um, and so we'll see. We'll see where this goes. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been patiently waiting. It's been three and a half years, man. You know, being being in that situation, I understand how things go. You know, and then again, like I said, the unexpected COVID happened. So, yeah. Well, let's, uh, yeah, let's, uh, we'll keep an eye out on that and see how it goes. And yeah, hopefully, hopefully they, they get life. Michael Boatwright, I think is the name. Like, yeah, like. I think that's the that's that's the killer. Yeah, the, boat right. They said that yeah, the one that pulled the trigger. I believe so. I'm not my my memory's not the best, but I do think that's mm -hmm. the, yeah. He well, we'll pray he gets he gets life, and I know it won't bring back your son, but I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, there's nothing nothing we can do about that. And I guess yeah, man, it was it was great to talk to you, man. Like uh, you gave a lot of insights. I appreciate that. And yeah, man. Um just uh like I said, what just put the word out that you know they they I wouldn't say the trial, the trial doesn't start, but I know September is where you know um all the preliminaries leading up to a trial or 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 pleading starts in September. So all the supporters needs to know that okay. um, working on the, the actual charity. I can't give you a date on that yet, but um, as I said, this clothing line will directly affect the charity. It's going to be as far as the funding for the charity and um, the causes I'm championing. And like I said, one of them is mental illness, um, education. Yeah. So that's where I'm at with it, brother. I thank you for your time as well. 
Yeah, uh, thank you for sharing some of those stories that you shared, and let me know when uh, when the charity launches, and we'll, uh, we'll we'll do some shout out for it, and um, and kind of send some people that way. As well. I pray. Let me cut you off. I pray God, man, continues to. You, you believe in God, right? Uh, I'm, no. I'm a psychedelic user, so I've all right. Uh, some weird um, I hope you continue your sobriety, man. Yeah. Hope you stay stay on stay on track, man. No, I meant uh, I meant like um, like I've taken some LSD in the past and seen some seen some stuff, you know. And I'm not sure. It's like it's not God in the in the general sense. It's kind of like a universal thing. It's like uh, God is God is not outside. The Creator is not outside of you, man. The creator is in, is within. Mm-hmm. It's 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 almost like you say the higher self. Yeah. You know what I mean? The the perfect self then. So whatever you want to call it, whatever you believe in, man, I'm, I hope you stay focused and stay on track, man. And I wish the best for you, brother. I appreciate you, know? it. you as well. You have kids? You have kids? No, 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 no kids yet. No kids yet. Well, your son, your, your, your son that's yet to come will need you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, you know, the world needs you, brother. Appreciate so it. Thank you very much for your time. I Thanks. wish you all the best as well. Thank you. And uh, one other thing as well, if you need, um, you said you weren't an expert on mental health. If you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out. And if there's anything uh, confusing for you there, like I'll be, I'll be happy to help you in that. You know. mm-hmm. Most stuff, man. All right, brother. You have a good night. Thank you for your time. Take care. Blessings on blessings. Bye. All right.